Mohamed El Arian, the PIMCO CEO and co CIO, is joining us now uh, on this program. And uh, uh, Mohamed, thanks so much for joining us. I want to ask you first about the about comments from Bill Gross, who was just made, who was just on Bloomberg Radio and said, "Look, the numbers that came out this morning suggest that the Fed is not going to taper; that it's going to just stay on course with QE." Do you agree? I do. This is a muddled middle number when it comes to the Fed and when it comes to markets. It's not strong enough to give the Fed assurances of this handoff that everybody wants, the growth handoff. But it's not weak enough for it to say, I'm going to increase um, QE a lot. So the Fed is going to look left and right, left and right, and we suspect it's going to be frozen. For economists, it confirms what you've heard over and over again. Our economy is improving, but not improving fast enough. And that's con of concern to those of us who worry about problems getting structurally embedded into the system. Is that why, Mohammed, you're suggesting investors pare back some risk? Yes, what we're seeing is that people are questioning the win-win proposition that dominated markets till two, months ago, till two weeks ago. And it was a very strong win-win proposition. Either the Fed is successful and therefore artificial prices are validated by fundamentals, or the Fed needs to do more and therefore asset prices get more liquidity support. Mm -hmm. And this win-win proposition was deeply embedded in the psyche of the markets. Now, with what happened in Japan, with the weaker numbers, there's investors' trust and faith is getting shaken in this proposition. And that's why you're seeing liquidity being withdrawn. And we've been saying for a while now, you know what, walk away from risk, take some off the table and just watch for a while. Well, Mohammed, it's Dominic here. One of the things that we talk about is this, the, the data points that we're seeing, the seesaw, the push and pull that you're talking about. Overall, is the Fed effectively doing its job in trying to lower that unemployment rate? We are seeing job gains. We are seeing unemployment tick lower. Is it just going to be a more drawn out process? Is the Fed actually doing anything with quantitative easing on that front? So the Fed, Dominic, is buying time just like the ECB is buying time, just like the Bank of Japan is trying to buy time. What the, what the central banks cannot do, because they don't have the right instruments, is deliver the outcomes. So the Fed is buying time for the system to heal and hopefully for Washington to wake up and do the right thing. So yes, things are steadily improving, but not fast enough. Now, Dominic, keep an eye on a few numbers. Yes, we created 175,000 jobs, and that's really important. But long-term unemployment remains at 4.4 million. That's too high. Youth unemployment, teenage unemployment is at 24.5 percent. That's too high. And the employment education gap is too high. So the Fed risks right. giving the politicians comfort when they shouldn't have comfort because the structural element of our job for the market Mohammed, are re is really worrisome. Uh, we are back with PIMCO CEO Mohamed El Arian. Mohamed, uh, what's interesting about today's rally, and I want to get your perspective on this, is that you have all the groups rising on the S&P, but it's the defensive stocks that are, that are leading the gains today. It's the consumer staples. It's the health care shares that are. What does that tell you? Tells you two things. First, that the number, as you say, was better than expected. Not just better than consensus expectation, but lots of the whisper numbers were down at 115, 110,000. So that's giving a general boost. But people are worried. They're not quite sure what the reaction to these markets is going to be. Some believe that better markets will actually bring out more sellers. And that's why you're getting the quality difference playing out in the markets today. Uh, absolutely, that's right. That then maybe we're going to see that correction, uh, and also at the same time, Mohammed, people are watching what's going on in the bond markets and where the yields are going to go. If in fact the Fed does, uh, as you say, look left, look right, they're kind of sort of just staying where they are at this moment. Uh, these, I, this idea of a yield at three percent by the end of 2013 is that still farther off? I think it's further out. Um, we think that yields are in a super secular rise, but cyclically they're going to be quite range bound. And that's because of the tug of war that's going on, because you're neither getting a very strong economy, nor you're getting the Fed able to exit completely. And, and that's going to cause yields in the short term 
on treasuries. And remember, as Bill said this morning with Tom Keane, you know, it's a market of bonds. There's lots and lots of bonds. There's lots and lots of different risk factors. But if you're looking at interest rate risk, we think it will continue to be a range bound. Inflation, though, could that run away from us? Not in the short term. It's hard to get inflation dynamics in the short term. Over the longer term, however, I think that you could get higher and less stable inflation. But a lot is going to depend on the key call that the Fed has to make and that all of us have, have to make, which is where is the natural rate of unemployment? Has that gone up or has it stayed? Because if it has gone up and if it's not below six, but if it's seven, then inflationary pressures may come back much earlier than most people expect. Well, Mohammed, on that point, though, is there a natural level or a natural state or a new state of where we are in housing? Because everybody this week has been saying to us how housing is really going to lead this economy out and that it's been adding uh, substantially to the jobs market. Are you, a, are you a buyer of that view? We're a buyer that the housing market has stabilized. And that's really important because housing plays such an important, compo such an important role in the overall economy and in people's well-being. So it's great news that it has stabilized. Now, when you ask the general issue, right, we think it's just going to be stabilizing for a while. Some segments will do particularly well, others won't. But this is not the sector that's going to take us out. The key element is the household and the corporate sector. We need to see companies investing a lot more. And we need to see people having greater confidence in their ability to increase their earnings. And that's another thing that the employment report um, was worrisome on, is it suggested that our average hourly earnings are flat. Right. They were unchanged. I'm looking month on month unchanged. And, uh, and year on year, earnings grew about 2%, but that was pretty much... Uh, as well uh, unchanged from the prior month and also below what economists had forecast. That's right. And that's really important because you've got the corporate sector and the household sector that have to do more of the heavy lifting while the government is contracting. Uh, and on the government side, Mohammed, you know, sequestration, surprisingly, does not seem to be the big headline news on jobs as we had thought. I mean, it's affected some areas. What does that tell you? Well, the government lost 3,000 jobs, which is, which, you know, you, you don't want to see these negative numbers, not, not at this stage of the cycle. So that's not good news. The sequester issue is a really difficult one, Betty, because it's so sector specific that it's going to play out over time as opposed to have an immediate impact. And that's what we're seeing. Mohamed Arian, the CEO of PIMCO, staying with me. And of course, Mohamed, you and I have talked quite a bit about the Chinese economy. Uh, what do you think the president needs to press with, uh, with, with the Chinese president at this weekend summit? So, Betty, if you look at the items that are set to be on the agenda, cybersecurity, um, trade, etc., they speak to a fundamental difference, and that is how China is seen and sees itself in the global economy. There is the external view that says, China, you're the second largest economy in the world. You have global responsibilities, right. and you need to step up to these global responsibilities. That's the view that the U.S. and many others take. Then there's the Chinese view that says, we may be the second largest economy, but we're still a poor country. Our per capita income is very low, mm -hmm. and therefore we have to worry about our national responsibilities. And it's that conflict between global and national responsibilities that plays out in cyberspace, that plays out on trade, on the exchange rate. And it's really important that we converge to a common view. Uh, and isn't it going to be more difficult, Mohammed, for the president to press the Chinese on cyber attacks uh, when, as we know, the White House is facing a bigger and bigger blow up over its own surveillance program? Yeah, I think there's a fundamental distinction between cyber attacks that go after commercial information and national security issues. I think, you know, most people would agree, even if you even go to, to the Russians and the Chinese, they say spying for national security issues is fine, but spying for commercial issues, that's a different issue. And, and that's the difference, is whether, is whether there, we, there is that difference out there. The problem is a lot of the cybersecurity have to do with companies, 
right? Companies that feel that their secrets are being taken away from them. Right, that they're being stolen. Uh, uh, Mohammed, let's pivot for a moment, though, uh, staying in Asia, but pivot to Japan, because I want to play for you. Uh, Japan, obviously, a big factor in the market these days. I want to play for you uh, your colleague again, Bill Gross, what he said about Japan's stimulus policy and how it's uh, wreaking havoc on the market. The Bank of Japan has set in motion, you know, perhaps an unanticipated increase in currency, interest rate, and spread volatility. They didn't want to do this, but, you know, we, we suppose that they expected their QE to act much like the, the Fed's QE, and that was, uh, you know, dampening volatility and keeping interest rates low. Uh, that hasn't happened. So why isn't that happening, Mohammed? So a couple of reasons, and this is really important because what's happening in Japan is having an influence on other markets. First, the Japanese thought, you know what, we can do QE, and we'll do QE that's three times as much in relative terms as the U.S. Right. And the markets initially responded very enthusiastically to that until they realized that Japan's initial conditions are much worse. The demographics are much more challenging. Yields started from a much lower base. They cannot capture demand internally, they also have to capture it externally. So other countries started saying, hey, wait a minute, I don't want my demand being taken away by you. So what we're seeing now is a bit of a rejection to, to QE in Japan. And that has raised questions in people's mind about the notion that central banks are all powerful and therefore they can deliver any market outcome. Could that have any impact on our own stimulus? Oh, I it will have an impact on the inf impact of the influence. And we've seen it. The minute Japan gets disrupted, carry trades get disrupted. So you get what one of our colleagues here at PIMCO called the assault on carry trade, which is what happened last week. That sucks liquidity out of the system. The disruptions cascade down the capital structure. The equity markets sell off. So all this is really consequential. And that's why investors, even if they're not invested in Japan, have to keep a close eye on what happens there every night. Uh, and Mohammed, uh, we're taking a tour through the world. Just uh, on a final note in Europe, because we, you, as you know, we had the ECB come out. They left interest rates unchanged. Draghi feels a bit more optimistic about next year. Is he a little bit too ahead of his time there in Europe? Yes. I, and I think that even ahead of that time this year, even though they're revising down the projection. So they've revised down the projection of growth to minus negative 0.6. We think it's more likely to be between minus 0.75 and minus 125 so it's going to be an even more difficult year this year and we just don't see how they rebound to over one percent next year it's hard to identify the source of demand that's going to cause that so i think the outlook unfortunately is not as good as the ecb would like it to be Mohammed, thank you again for joining us and staying with us through the opening bell Mohammed el, -El, -El the pimco ceo and co-cio